Okay, this is video lecture number 30. We are looking at the American Industrial Revolution. Um, at first, it seemed unlikely that the United States would become an industrial nation. Uh, only one nation in the world, Great Britain, had progressed very far toward industrialization at the beginning of the 19th century. Uh, and its factories owed much of their success to the cheap labor resulting from widespread poverty. Blessed with large amounts of land, uh, once the Indian population was dealt with, uh, and relatively few people, Americans such as Thomas Jefferson expected the nation to remain agricultural. Uh, indeed, since they saw factories and industrial cities as teeming with mobs of poor, dependent people, uh, they hoped that such unrepublican institutions would remain far from their shores. Others, however, did not share Jefferson's enthusiasm for the virtues of an ideal agrarian economy. Uh, in reality, much of the agriculture in America depended on slave labor, uh, and the evils of this system blatantly contradicted the Republican ideals of Jefferson's vision. Uh, the emergence of the textile industry then uh, depended on several factors. Uh, entrepreneurs with access to capital, uh, an abundant source of cheap labor, uh, and a reliable source of energy. In New England, wealthy merchants uh, Francis Cabot Lowell and Nathan Appleton uh, successfully invested in a number of textile factories powered by water wheels. They obtained their workforce by hiring children uh, and large numbers of young women uh, from New England farms to work temporarily at their mills while living in well-supervised boarding houses. Uh, at least initially, these factory jobs were quite attractive to the young women who found in them uh, a means of escaping the drudgery of the farm, uh, an opportunity to enjoy some freedom uh, between childhood and marriage, uh, and a means of accumulating some money. The paternalism uh, uh, then of what was called the Waltham Plan uh, also seemed to offer a Republican American alternative to the specter of the pauper labor that haunted industrial Great Britain and Thomas Jefferson alike. By the 1840s, the impact of the Industrial Revolution in America was becoming increasingly apparent. Uh, new machinery and new ways of organizing labor had resulted in unparalleled economic growth. Uh, some observers, thus, uh, welcomed these innovations as necessary for the United States to join the industrial powers, uh, but others were not certain uh, that their beliefs exceeded their costs. Joseph Whitworth and Orestes A. Brownson represent these extremes. Uh, while the former celebrated the contributions of independence, uh, contributions and independence of the laboring classes, the latter thought their situation was worse off than slaves in the South. So let's take a closer look at our different sections today, starting with the division of labor and the factory. Two great changes defined the early 19th century American economy. Uh, the growth and mechanization of industry, the Industrial Revolution, uh, and the expansion and integration of markets, which is called the Market Revolution. Industrialization came to the United States between 1790 and 1820 as merchants and manufacturers increased output of goods by reorganizing work and building factories. The outwork system was a more efficient division of labor and lowered the price of goods, but it eroded workers' control over the pace and conditions of work. For tasks not suited to outwork, factories were created where work was concentrated under one roof and divided into specialized tasks. Manufacturers used newly improved stationary steam engines to power their mills, and they used power-driven machines and assembly lines to produce new types of products. Some Britons feared that American manufacturers would become exporters, not only to foreign countries, but even to England itself. All right, so let's look at our next section, which is the textile industry and British competition. 
British textile manufacturers were particularly worried about American competition. Uh, Britain, in fact, prohibited the export of textile machinery, and they also prohibited the emigration of mechanics who knew how to build them. Uh, but many mechanics disguised themselves as ordinary laborers, and they set sail for America. Samuel Slater uh, was one of these. Uh, he brought to America a design for an advanced cotton spinner. And the opening of his factory in 1790 marked the advent of the American Industrial Revolution. America had an abundance of natural resources, but British companies were better established and had less expensive shipping rates, lower interest rates, and they also had cheaper labor. Congress then uh, passed protective legislation in 1816, 1824, and 28, levying high taxes on imported goods, uh, and, but tariffs were again reduced in the late 1830s. Uh, American producers used two other strategies to compete with their British rivals. First, they improved on British technology. Second, they found less expensive workers. By copying the machines of British textile mills, Francis Cabot Lowell's Boston Manufacturing Company uh, was able to build the Waltham Factory, uh, which is the first American factory to perform all the operations of cloth making under one roof at higher speeds than British mills and with fewer workers. The Boston Manufacturing Company pioneered a labor system that became known as the Waltham Plan, uh, in which the company recruited farm women and girls as textile workers who would work for low wages. By the early 1830s, more than 40,000 New England women worked in textile mills. Uh, women often found this work oppressive, uh, but many gained a new sense of freedom and autonomy. By combining improved technology, female labor, and tariff protection, uh, the Boston Manufacturing Company sold textiles at cheaper prices than any British company. Our third section then is American Mechanics and Technological Innovation. By the 1820s, American-born craftsmen had replaced British immigrants at the cutting edge of technological innovation. The most important inventors in the Philadelphia region were members of the Sellers family, uh, who helped found the Franklin Institute of Philadelphia in 1824. Uh, mechanic institutes were established in other states then, uh, and these institutes disseminated technical knowledge and encouraged innovation. Uh, in 1820, the U.S. Patent Office issued about 200 patents each year, uh, but by 1860, it was awarding 4,000 patents each year. Uh, American mechanics pioneered the development of machine tools, uh, thus fueling the spread of the Industrial Revolution. In the firearms industry, uh, in particular, Eli Whitney and others developed the idea of interchangeable uh, and precision crafted parts that enabled large-scale production. The expansion in the availability of machines allowed the American Industrial Revolution to come of age. Uh, the volume and availability of output caused some products, in particular uh, Remington rifles, Singer sewing machines, and Yale locks, uh, to become household names. After the 1851 Crystal Palace exhibition in London, uh, Americans built factories in Britain uh, and soon dominated many European markets. Our last section then is wage workers and the labor movement. The Industrial Revolution changed the nature of work and workers' lives. Uh, many American craft workers had developed an artisan Republican ideology a collective identity based on the principles of liberty and equality. They saw themselves as small-scale producers, uh, making things in their homes, uh, equal to one another, and free to work for themselves. But as the outwork and factory system spread, more and more of these workers took jobs as dependent wage earners. Now, some journeymen formed unions and bargained with their employers, particularly uh, with the hope of setting uh, at least a 10-hour workday. By the mid-1830s, building trades unions had won that 10-hour workday from many employers and also from the federal government. Uh, 
artisans whose occupations were threatened by industrialization, uh, shoemakers, printers, and so on, uh, were less successful. And some left their employers and set up specialized shops. Uh, this new industrial system divided the traditional artisan class then into two groups, self-employed craftsmen and wage-earning craftsmen. Under English and American common law, it was illegal for workers to organize themselves for the purpose of, weight of, of raising wages because they prevented other workers from hiring themselves out for whatever wages they wished. In 1830, factory workers then banded together to form a mutual benefit society to seek higher pay uh, and better conditions. In 1834, the National Trades Union was founded. Uh, factory owners resisted unions uh, by circling a list called a blacklist of union members. The owners agreed to dismiss and not hire anybody on these blacklists. In Commonwealth versus Hunt in 1824, uh, the right of workers to strike was upheld in order to enforce something called a closed shop agreement that limited employment in certain places to just union members. Uh, union leaders devised a labor theory of value and organized strikes for higher wages. Uh, similar labor actions were taken by women textile workers as well. By the 1850s, labor supply exceeded demand and unemployment rose to 10%, resulting in a major recession and also in the Panic of 1857. This concludes then video lecture number 30. Please address the review questions at the bottom of the screen and continue on with your work.